Welcome to Women Winning Divorce. I am your host, Heather Quick. I am an attorney, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Florida Women's Law Group, the only divorce firm for women by women. I love thinking big, thinking outside the box, creating creative solutions for women and empowering women to win in all aspects of their life. In each episode of this show, I will discuss how to navigate the divorce process, come out stronger and empowered on the other side. Welcome to Women Winning Divorce. Each week, we discuss issues including divorce, custody, alimony, paternity, narcissism, mediation, and other family law issues to provide insight on the journey of women winning divorce. I'm Heather Quick, owner and attorney of Florida Women's Law Group. And today it is my honor to welcome our guest, Ellen Ball, who is an attorney with us at Florida Women's Law Group. Welcome to the show, Ellen. Hi. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, now, Ellen, um, we uh, ask all of our participants on the show about family law because, as we know, family law presents its own um, particular challenges. Um, and not everybody's cut out to practice family law. So I always like to ask any of our guests, um, you know, what made you choose family law and really why do you stay? What makes you stay in it? Well, family law is one of those really unique areas where you can touch all different areas of the law, whether it's real estate or, you know, any of those other kind of matters, but you help people. It's not very often in any litigation that you actually help people you're going through a rough time, I can help see you to the other side. I can help see you to where, you know, you need to be and being able to help somebody and to see the growth and the positives and, and, um, all of those benefits, it keeps me coming back. It's so great to see from the start to the finish, how people evolve. Well, um, that is so true. And, you know, you understand the varying range, you know, that clients have during the family law process. And, you know, it, it does, it, it, so many areas of life and the law that intersect that um, affect people in just such a unique way. And, you know, you bring that, you know, that knowledge and that expertise in the area of family law, but you're also a mom and you understand that, how, how difficult that can be for the women, because, you know, any of us that have children, we know that yeah. that's going to make things, always make things more difficult, doesn't it? Oh, always. And it, it isn't just having kids make things difficult. It's seeing how each kid is different and how each family is different and how everything can be literally the same, but each person is just a little bit different and each child takes things differently. Each person takes things differently. You know, there's no two experiences that are really alike. It's something that is unique to each family. Yeah. And I guess not even to say difficult, but just more challenging because it's more yeah. to think about than just yourself. Yes, when absolutely. You're going through the divorce because many people, Folks, you know, many of our clients, it's just them versus their husband, and they still have challenges going through right. it. But when you have to take into consideration, particularly small children yes. or, that are so minors, it, it just adds another level uh, for our clients, doesn't it? It does. And females, especially, we tend to think about others before we think about ourselves. And having to remind clients that it is okay in this moment to think, what is it that you need? What is best for you? Because whatever is best for you will invariably be better for your kids. When you're at your best self, so are your kids. And you're the best mother to your kids. You know, it, it's one of those things. There's no one component of it. Everything affects the other. And it's okay as a mom to stand back and say, this is not okay. My kids need better. I deserve better. It's okay and, to say that. And I know, and I think, it is. And I, I've noticed that in, you know, in all these years practicing that something about going through a divorce, even if, and I'm not saying women before that weren't putting their kids first, but then there's big issues to be decided or things they need to think about. And it's, it's almost harder to then now put themselves in front right. of their kids because that's the way they see it, but it's not right. really an either or. Right. It's it, it's it isn't. As a mom, our first instinct is how is this the best for my kids? But you you know, what we see, especially what we do, is we see that when you're at your best, you're the best parent to your kid. And moms, especially, we tend to forget that 
I need to be good too. I need to be at my best. I need to be happy in order to make sure my kids are happy. And it's, you know, we're there to remind them this wasn't working. You said it wasn't working. Let us, you know, help you get through that. Because if you're not happy, your kids see that too. And unfortunately, females already, but moms even more so, we're on the back burner because we want to take care of everybody else. We're here to take care of you. That's that's part of our job. Yes, and I'm so glad to have you on our team and especially to talk about the topic today. Because I know we started talking about kids, but there are children involved in this topic as well. She's at a different age. And our topic yes. for today is gray divorce. Um, and that is defined, and I don't know who keyed the term, and it's been around for quite some time, but it's when people over 50 years old uh, that have been in decades-long marriages divorce. And so, you know, I, this is this name is so ancient, and, and it, I really do think it's kind of sexist, but, you know, I throw that term around a lot. But, you know, it comes from, you know, associating older people with gray hair. Well, Lord knows, I, I, I'm not going to be walking around with gray hair, you know, I mean, I'll dye it till, till the end, you know, <laughs> it's between me and my colorist, quite frankly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So either way, that is the term that has now been, um, you know, around for, for quite some time. And it, depending on, you know, what celebrity is getting divorced and their age, you know, it comes up a little bit more in the media, but you know, the, what some interesting statistics on it is that, um, according you know to the U.S. Census Bureau, divorce rates were the highest for couples between the ages of fifty-five and sixty-four. Oh, okay, yeah, I can and, see that. You know, and and it is a diff. There are different. I don't know if they're different issues. There are a lot of the same issues. But we look at them differently, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. When one is a much longer term marriage and we have individuals who are in their 50s and 60s getting a divorce rather than in their 30s. Oh, absolutely. You know, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier. The kids are different ages. So you're not looking at the time sharing and, the, you know, what people used to call custody. Now it's other things. The kids have grown. But have I stayed home for the kids? And how does that impact me financially? And how do we divvy up the college funds? And what is what does my future look like now that I'm not a mom? You know, you're evolving into this different space and does your husband evolve with you and, and should he evolve with you or do you need to evolve on your own and, and step forward on your own? That's such a pivotal time. You know, it's almost like a rebirth. Same thing when you're 25, who you are at 55. It, it's like you're a whole new person. Right, because you have all this life experience and many yeah. people do ask, right? Like, well, why, why is that? that those divorce rates are higher. And I think, you know, and you know, when we get these stats, sometimes they're a few years older, but mm -hmm. I do think that when we look at, you know, couples that have been married for, you know, say over 30 years, they were attending, what I tend to see, and now of course the age goes up in, in my mind, you know, when you're seeing someone over 60, um, to seventies, getting divorced right now from a long-term marriage. They probably got married when they were really young. Um, yeah. and that a lot of things have changed since then. And even in, you know, in the past 40 years, you know, things are different in marriages and not as many women went into the workforce, yeah. um, back then. And many of them, it was just a little bit more common I mean, not that we don't still have women today who stay home, but it was much more common back then that the husband was the breadwinner and the wife stayed home with the children. And I think that when we were seeing this high divorce rate for that age group, which really, a bit, let's say this, the baby boomers, I think that's, and you know, that's a huge gap. That's a, yeah. a, quite a large span, but when and that's when it first started to get, yeah. Um, term, I believe. But, uh, you know, that generation in particular, I think that women now, and especially if they, you know, were married 30, 40 years ago, uh, they're like, hey, I, you know, in some respects, I feel like I can do this now, but maybe 20 years ago, I would not have initiated a divorce. Oh, absolutely. You know, 20 years ago, the, 
their outlook on life is different. It's I have all of this time, whereas you get a little bit older, you know, you get into a long-term marriage, you're suddenly looking in your 60s of, well, I have all this time. Do I, what do I want it to look like? What I was comfortable with at 22, at 60, I'm not comfortable with anymore. And not only do I have all this time, but now I have limited resources or I, I understand what resources mean because you know, when you're 22, everything seems green and you have endless possibilities. Whereas the older you get, the more you realize that you have items, you know, limited income, or I need to know how much things cost, or I need to know budgeting. I need to know um, different areas like that, that I just didn't think to ask about when I was 22. You know, what you're looking at when you're 22 and then what you're looking at when you're in your 60s, it's a whole different parameters. You're asking the questions you didn't even know to ask at 22. You had no concept of uh, finances or investments or long-term goals or college plans. And at 60, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at what is the next stage. You're no longer naive about it. Right. And, you know, I think a big thing as well, because throughout the years, um, I've represented many, many women who were, you know, over 60 getting a divorce and they are looking at things differently, but they're also saying I'm in good shape. Yes. And if I live at least another 20, 25 years, 30, maybe this is who I want to spend it with. And I need to make a change. And I know that's a hard truth reality, but I think that's what a lot of them think, right? Absolutely. 60 is no longer, I mean, and we were talking about it earlier, the, the gray hair. I could not name a single person that I know of in their 60s that has gray hair. They are the people who are having the best time. They have endless amounts of time during the day to, to get what they need to get done, done. And then they get to enjoy themselves. And so they're looking at if I have all this time in the day, do I want to spend it with you? Are you worth spending my time with? Or am I deserving of something else? And nine times out of 10, yeah, you deserve something better. You deserve something more. And whatever it is that makes you happy, go for it. And they're making that decision and they're making that, that a reality. Um, and I agree. And I think, you know, there's a lot of different things. And many times, and it'll depend on the generation, but the baby boomers, you know, we know had the majority where they were having kids in their early 20s. So now the right. kids are gone, but they may have had a second career because people are working longer. I mean, my yeah. goodness, you know, very few people are prepared to retire at 62 with enough income to last them another 30 years. So yeah. they, they, they keep working, which I think does keep your mind and body, you know, alive and with it. But again, it's like we, especially when you're in, you know, good health and you don't have to be in that great health. I mean, people are living longer and it's just a, I think a realization that, oh my goodness, you know, when I said till death do us part, I guess I didn't really fully envision that being, you know, 60 years of my life and maybe this doesn't work for us anymore. And I think we saw it with COVID too. I mean, we said till death do us part. I don't think any of us really anticipated a pandemic to keep us in our house with only this one person for multiple months on end. And you that close quarters, you know, some marriages thrived, a lot didn't. So, you know, till death do us part or pandemic because you realize <laughs> this is not working and good for you for realizing it. Absolutely. Yes. And I think that's where, um, you know, it's, it's true because that was a big stressor, which of course, you know, we, we had, that was probably, that's certainly the biggest one since nine 11 that really like affected right. did, but it just went on forever. Right. It went, it went on in a way that impacted everybody's, um, daily life and that togetherness, that forced togetherness right in addition to like this forced isolation um certainly made it harder to ignore uh little, things about the other person maybe that yeah. you really you're really busy and out with others and traveling you don't have to focus on as much right absolutely and, and we've heard stories i don't know if you've heard them recently but something as little as the way they put the dishwasher 
the dishes in the dishwasher. It was fine when they tried to load the dishwasher once a month and now they're doing it every day and I just can't handle it. And, you know, you kind of, you grow from there and it's the little things that have built up and COVID was kind of a pressure cooker where it all, it all came to light and you realize, oh, what we thought we had in common, we don't have in common. And so let's, you know, let's move on from that, so to speak. Let's, let's call it what it is. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, and that, that's just what happens in life. Yeah. Um, And that we grow, uh, hopefully, you know, as humans, we grow and we become wiser and smarter, learn from life experience, but we also, you know, try to grow our mind and our thoughts uh, throughout life. But sometimes we're growing in different directions. You know, we've all experienced that where you, you do grow in different directions from your friends you know, it's just not the same. Um, you guys have the commonalities that you thought you did when you were younger. And um, and that can happen in the relationship too, that growth. And all of a sudden here, you know, you're 65 and you're like, I still have a lot of living left to do and a lot of things. And this is not the person that, or maybe I'm not the person you, which you really aren't going to be, or you weren't, most of us aren't the person they were at 21, thankfully. But, um, yeah. you know, when you wake up and look at that, you're like, gosh, but we aren't, yeah, we aren't really that match that we were, and it's just not working. And that doesn't mean anybody's a bad person or anything. It's just kind of time and growing apart. Absolutely. And that self-reflection to say, I have, I'm ready to evolve from this. Indeed. Well, all right. When we come back, we're going to talk about special factors or things that maybe you need to grade a divorce that we're going to talk about. So we'll be right back. Welcome back to Women Winning Divorce. We are joined by Ellen Ball, an attorney here at Florida Women's Law Group. And today we are discussing gray divorce, which is really divorcing later in life after a long-term marriage. Um, and there's really a a lot more to consider than, uh, say, shorter term marriage, um, divorce, younger in life. Uh, This is the time when people are looking at retirement. um, And, you know, really those, what do they used to call them, Ellen, the golden years? Do they say the golden years? Is that, was that the thing or am I making that up? I don't know. I don't know. I'm of the age and the generation where the golden girls are what we all strive to be. (laughs) Just be the Arthur. I'm here for it. They were living their best life, having their cheesecake every night. I wish I could do that. Well, you're too young right now, so we just wait. Um, but anyway, let's talk about some things that are different in Great Divorce. Because if if we're looking at, say, traditionally, like, already retired, um, which, again, you know, many, many of our listeners, you might not be there yet. But when we're, let's say we're looking at retirement, I mean, then when we look at finances, they're somewhat, well, they are fixed, right? We've got a certain amount of income every month and assets and investments. Absolutely. They're, they're fixed in terms of what am I getting from social security too? What am I getting from my investments? What am I getting from my pension? But is that enough every month if it's just myself? You know, health insurance is also going up and, and do I need a supplemental policy in, in addition to my Medicaid or my Medicare? You know, what is it that is, you know, interest rates go up. Am I going to qualify for the same mortgage that I would have qualified 20 years ago? You know, it's all of those financial terms. You're no longer focused on what's best for the kids, but what's best for me. And and financially, that's a huge component. Absolutely. And, you know, we look at that. And so then it's obviously, well, we're going to be dividing those pensions, 401ks and Mm -hmm. investments. And then most individuals, um, or most couples, uh, you know, their house is a big asset. And absolutely that's good at that point because then that can be sold and and split, which then again gives you some more some more liquidity. But um we also, when we're planning this, you know, we're we're looking at it from the angle, well, if you guys aren't are no longer working, there may not be the alimony aspect. It's really just dividing everything that you two have and then understanding, hey, where are you both going to be situated financially with the income that's there? 
And, and a huge part of that, going back to the house, is, is figuring out too, and do I need this large house? Do I need to downsize? And the, the concept of downsizing has kind of a negative frame to it, but you also half the time don't need this, this big piece of property to move forward. You know, what do we need to fit your needs? What do we need to fit your budget? What is your budget? You know, what is it that um, you, that is most important to you? And not everyone is going to say that my housing is the most important. Some people might say, you know what, I've raised my kids. Traveling is the most important and having something small. So I have the extra income every month is important. Each person's golden year, so to say, are, they're going to look different. They're going to look different for each person. Yes, I agree. And and right. And it is kind of, it can be very liberating too, I think, for women to think about that, that you don't have to have this big house and this upkeep anymore. And it may not make the best financial sense for you either. Yeah. You know, you're kind of beholden to this large home and then the cost of maintaining it, even if the cost to maintain it, it you can manage that, it's still may not be the best fit for you because like you said, if you have the ability and flexibility to travel, that may be a better use of your time and money uh, than you know a large home that you have to keep up with. And um, you know, for one thing, I did want to talk about because when we talk about the finances and income at for gray divorce, and let's say, you know, definitely over 65, but I think what a lot of women are unaware of or may not be aware of is, you know, even if you didn't work and put money into Social Security absolutely during your life, now that you're divorced, you have the option to receive Social Security as the ex-wife of your husband. And the, the thing that's beautiful about it is you'll get more than, you know, if you hadn't paid in. And it's not going to decrease his any. So it really can be a, a good boost um, that you might not have considered um, at, you know, when you're starting to think about divorce, right? And income. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I get a lot of people who, unfortunately, they've married somebody who says, well, I'm the one who worked all those years. It's my retirement. I pay for the house you just lived here, you didn't do anything. And they've completely discounted everything you've done in the home. So by dividing that social security or that pension or that retirement, it's a, it's a piece of acknowledging the contribution you made because I was home with the kids. I was home doing the house. Look at how far you got to go. Now I get a part mm -hmm. of that too. You know, it, it's something that you worked for as well. And it's recognizing the contributions you made, not just to his career, but to his family to your lifestyle, it's something that you put in just as much work for. You should have the pension, the retirement. And had you been in the workplace, you absolutely would have had it, if not more so. Absolutely. And, you know, and I, I really like that conversation, you know, that we do have with women because to, you know, from my perspective, and this is what I share with them, that's a given, like that's not even negotiable, arguing, not worth it. And yep. they are typically like, he's going to freak out. He's like, that's, he will, he's told me that's his retirement. And I tell him that's a property, right? That we are yep. just fighting 50, 50. We're not even talking about alimony or spousal support. This is yours. It's half yours. End of discussion. You get it. Now we move on to the next thing, right? Absolutely. Everyone is concerned. Well, I know I get half the house. I'm on the deed. You know, I know that, but I don't have any retirement or I don't have a nest egg. He has all of it. No, he, you have it too. We're going to go for it. We're going to seek it. Everything that you're entitled to by law, we're going to seek it. And we're going to make sure that you know what it is, because that's part of it too, is making sure you know what you're entitled to. Absolutely. And then so sometimes that's why, you know, we might involve the financial advisor and, or an accountant. And that yes. really can be so helpful, especially for tax treatment of certain assets um, because when we're negotiating for them and, and going to, you know, through mediation, it's really important to know because they're not always all equal. And even if we do divide everything, 
it's important to understand, hey, how will that impact you, you know, tax wise? Um, and so that's really important because we don't want, you know, tax implications unexpectedly. Absolutely. The last thing that I think any of us would want to do is negotiate what we think is a great settlement to have you hit on the back end with a financial penalty. We want to make sure that we have brought in the best people who you connect with that can give you the very specialized, very specific advice that, you know, we may, because it's not our bread and butter, it's not our everyday, it's not our nuanced area, let's bring them in. You know, we have great people around us. We have great people who know that area. Why not reach out to them and use all resources available to us? It, it would be a, a waste of your time if we did it. No, you're absolutely right, Ellen. It would be a waste of, or, or I hate to say waste of time, but yet it is because, you know, we always bring in those tax experts because we don't know what we don't know about taxes, right? We're not tax attorneys. Like I'm not absolutely thank absolutely goodness, studying that code that changes and comes out with things every year. Yeah. And there is going to be different treatment and different ways to look at things, you know, as you are retiring. And also because you're looking at, I am going to live off of investments, retirement money. And, and so therefore, like you were saying, the financial advisors, that's so important. Like what's the reasonable rate of return on these investments? Mm -hmm. That's not going to be overshooting it, right? And, and we don't want to yeah. plan your life on, you know, unrealistic returns. We need somebody who says, hey, this is a conservative, not too conservative, not too crazy, but this is a fair rate of return on your investments that, we, you should be able to plan for, right? Absolutely. And because people are living longer, that becomes even more important. You know, it used to be after you retire, you have maybe 10, 15, 20 years. Now we're looking at 30. Now we're looking at 40. Well, 30 years, that could have been a whole nother career. So you're living longer. Your needs are different. Your priorities are different. It, having somebody who knows the tax code, but who knows you know, the, the market analysis, that's, that's so helpful. We know the ins and outs of the family law system and the, you know, laws about distribution, but I don't know the tax code. I'm going to bring in somebody who does. Part of what I can do and part of, of, you know, our services to our clients is say, I don't actually know that area because it is so nuanced. Let me bring in somebody who does. I am humble enough to say, I do not know the tax code. This person does. Let's bring them in. Let's add them to our team. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it makes such a big difference because, you know, you know, too many individuals go through a divorce or mediation and they really are, they don't know. They're not given that opportunity to consult with that. And, and it can really end up, you know, where what you negotiated for really didn't turn out quite the way you thought. And that's never a good thing, right? When you're, especially when we're looking at your retirement years and you're not maybe headed back out in the workforce. Absolutely. And for some, but, some um, women, they don't even know what their investment strategy is. It's a question that's never even been put to them. It's a decision they've never been able to make on their own. So having that financial advisor there gives them the information they can make their own decision. You know, something they haven't been able to do, let's give them the information they need to make the decision. Um, another decision that, well, or a, a topic that comes up a lot, I mean, it comes up in all divorces, but I think, okay, the older we get, the more we realize better have that insurance. And, you know, I want my insurance, I don't want my insurance to change. Yes. Unfortunately, that, that's gonna probably happen. But we got to talk about health insurance um, and get our clients certainly set up with, you know, at least a broker or somebody who can help them understand what that will look like after the divorce if, you know, they weren't the one who has the coverage through, um, you know, through whoever they were used to work for. Absolutely. And that's probably something as a budget item, as a, a line item in a budget takes up a huge part of their consideration is 
I know that I get certain benefits or certain health insurance through the government, but is there a supplemental policy that I need? What kind of supplemental policy do I need? If I get that policy, is my doctor that I've been going to for 20 years even covered? Do I now need to find a new doctor? And so, you know, all of these decisions kind of spiral and circle and interact like a Venn diagram that's also on kind of a cogwheel. It, it's something that is always part of the analysis and can be really overwhelming. So having that health insurance broker really helps to break down um, the choice into a, an, an easier framework. You know, we yes, can say absolutely. that not- and then you can understand, right? So absolutely. that you can understand your options and the different costs. Yes. Um, because in, yes, of course you want to see your doctor, but the prescriptions, and I mean, I think things have changed. I think they've changed a lot, whether it's, you know, towards the good or the bad, th- there are a lot of options with healthcare out there, but still there are some prescriptions that are still, you know, it, when that insurance change, you may not be covered. And, and that's going to be an important thing to know going in, right? Absolutely. And, and it's stuff that is an everyday prescription. It's your blood pressure medication, it's your insulin, it's your, you know, your heart medication. It's the stuff that it isn't a one-off. It's not an a antibiotic. It's an every month expense. And so should I spend more on health insurance because that means that my, my medications are cheaper? You know, where's that balance? And that's where having that broker can really help, that we can help kind of guide in that conversation too, because it impacts your distribution of, of how things are, are done. And sometimes even in your alimony distribution, if, if that's even mm-hmm. on the table. Right. Absolutely. Well, um, we are going to continue talking about gray divorce. We're going to take a quick break and then when we come back, um, I, I, we started the show talking about kids and we're going to end the show with a little bit about adult children and we're going to have a lot to say. You might be surprised. So, uh, stick around for that. We'll be right back. We are back, and today we're joined by Ellen Ball, uh, an attorney here at Florida Women's Law Group, and and we are talking about gray divorce, which is divorce, uh, you know, after a long marriage, and usually over 55. Um, I would say now over 65, but it's been a topic of discussion for years, and I don't know who coined the phrase, but it's been around a long time. And what we've talked about the finances, we've talked about the reasons why. And now this will be really interesting because we're going to talk about the adult children, which many people may think, well, why do we have to talk about them? But, well, there can be still a lot going on with your children, um, even though they're no longer dependent. Right, Ellen? Absolutely. We started by talking about the kids. We're going to end by talking about the kids because as parents, as moms, that's kind of something we always think about. But I'll tell you, having young children, they are so adaptable and they get used to a newer normal and they get used to a different routine. Although it seems like it's traumatic very quickly, whereas the older you get, the more the kids are set in their routine, they're set in what they think their family looks like. And you try to change any of it and they can really react to it. And it can be an emotional trigger that you didn't even realize you had. And it, it can be something that is almost as, as difficult as the decision itself. Yes. Um, and so one of the reasons, at least that we hear, and I've certainly heard over the past, is that couples just wait. They're like, hey, the kids have left the house. And, and maybe not even consciously, but they do think it'll be easier on the kids or they think it's a non-issue. You know, kids yeah. have been gone on nesters. You know what? I mean, I think we're done here. And they are pretty much like this is a non-issue. And boy, that that's, could be the furthest thing from the truth um, in my experience. And it just can be a range of emotions and responses by the adult children Um it, you know, and it varies. Uh, and I don't think it really has anything to do with their age because they can be in their thirties and just like, what are you talking about? Like my parents are going to get divorced. And, um, and they're a little bit, you know, we've talked about certainly in the show that I've talked about how, you know, all of all humans, we all have an identity. And for many women, 
you know, part of our identity is being a mother and a wife. And, you know, also with our children, you know, their identity is, hey, I'm, yeah, you know, I'm the oldest sibling, you know, out of three. And, you know, we're a family of four, we're a family of five, and this is my family unit. And you identify with that. And now you're 30 years old and you're like, what are you talking about? Y'all are getting divorced. Mom is dating. Dad's on internet apps. And it blows their mind. And absolutely. they have something to say about it, don't they? They absolutely do. <laughs> and I will say, as a divorce practitioner, it's something I tell my clients all the time is, they can have their opinion. It does not mean they get to tell you about it because whatever it is that you want, that's what you get to start doing. If you want to go on that date, you go on a date. If you want to swipe right or swipe left on Tinder, you swipe right, you swipe left. <laughs> Your adult kids, they get to live their life. Why don't you? Why don't you? And it's true, but they do tell you and they, oh, and they, they tell you. It. And I think it's, for, for any woman who is thinking about this or going through it, if you're going through it, you're probably like, yeah, I heard from them. And, you know, they're processing it yeah. in their own way. And they aren't used to seeing you as single. They aren't used to seeing you as anything other than their mother and, and their dad's wife. Like they just, it, it's going to take them some time. Um to adjust to it uh, on one hand, you know, I think very, very much so. Oh, and, and you're not just their mother or their dad's wife, but you're sometimes somebody's grandparent. But I'll tell you, you know, that doesn't mean that you're dead. Go for it. Have fun. Have, Absolutely. have be most fun. Have the laughs. Have even if it's just going out with your girlfriends and having a good night out with your girlfriends and having a glass of wine, don't feel that you have to justify that to your kids because they didn't justify their twenties to you. You should not have to justify your stage to them either. You know, and, and they weren't calling you for permission to go have fun in their twenties. You don't need to call them for permission either. That's kind of that's what we tell clients. Point, Ellen. Yeah, Ellen, that's a really good point. And in many times, you know, you are letting some feelings of guilt or whatever, and, and you don't need to ask their permission. And mm -hmm. also be careful for, you know, if you're treating your adult children as your therapist and maybe you yes. are oversharing. And, and I think that, that it is a natural response to be like, well, you shared this with me, so I'm going to share that I don't like this part. It, it does disrupt the balance of the relationship. I mean, and, and it's different from just support and like, hey, you know, making sure that, you know, they're there for you. But oversharing sometimes with your adult children, it, it may backfire in a way um, because they're just not ready to process. Even I don't care if they're 35, 40 years old. They are just and every child is going to be different, um, and, you know, as far as whether or not they are really ready to process just the fact of the divorce. And, and then, you know, we won't even get started on, you know, the dating afterwards, but so sometimes if you can just keep those boundaries in place, as far as the sharing, because I think that's going to protect you later on much more. If you do that and, and ideally have though. No, good friends or maybe, you know, siblings of your own that you, that would be more appropriate to share that with rather than your kids. Cause they're, it's not the same, but they're going no. through it and they're, it's not the same at all, but they're trying to process it. And I don't think I would hope, but I'll be optimistic. I think they say things, um, that aren't necessarily, um, intended to hurt, but they do because they haven't processed how this, yeah. what this means to their whole family unit. And, you know, uh, if they do have kids now, what, you know, how, how am I going to explain it to my kids that their grandparents aren't together? Well, um, things that, you know, are big issues. Well, they are issues to them. Right. But, and they're processing meeting a new person too. You know, everyone who goes through a divorce and, and I tell a lot of clients this, it's going to get worse sometimes before it gets better, but when it gets better, it gets a lot better. It's a rebirth. It's something that you have risen from the ashes and look at who you are now. 
well, your adult children, even though they're your children, they have to meet that person too in, a, in their own manner and in their own way and in their own process. And you've got to let them go through it, but that doesn't mean that you should stop yours. Let them go through it, Correct. let them be parallel to you, but it doesn't mean that you should stop your growth. You know, they'll catch up, they'll catch up. And they will, and they may, you know, I think they'll go through all the similar emotions Maybe in a different order. There's going to be anger on their part. I, I know I've heard from clients that their kids said, why, why did you wait so long? Like, why did we have to suffer through you know, right. you know, all these years of y'all hating each other? Okay, you know, parents are doing the best they can, right? It, it, yeah. What they have at the time. But I think it's normal that they're going to, uh, your children are going to go through that. They might have some guilt. They might be like, oh my God, you stayed together for us. They're going to be sad, but they're going to get over it, hopefully, yeah. and support you too. Um, and that's also kind of the less you um, share from a standpoint of intimate things that you would tell your therapist, um, mm -hmm. I think the better off that relationship will be, you know, by continuing to have the boundaries. Yeah. Uh, on that so that your adult children, hey, they can go through that with what they need to do. And hopefully, you know, everybody comes together at the end, right? And they're supportive of you because at the end of the day, they want their parents to be happy. They just can't see it as any way but together. Well, and it's the same thing that we tell people who have younger children too. When it comes down to planning the graduation or planning the wedding, they want both sides of the family there. They want mom and dad to be there. They want grandma and grandpa to be there. What you tell your girlfriend and what you tell your family or, or excuse me, what you tell your close friends about all of the issues you have on, on certain things, you don't need to tell the child of that person. You know, that's just a boundary line. What you tell your girlfriend is not what you tell your kid because your child, your grandchild needs to feel comfortable enough to have you at a family dinner and not have the knives come out or not be worried about plates breaking. You know, it's just that simple. But that also doesn't mean it stops your growth. You know, don't let that stand in your way of evolving either. Um, yeah, I so appreciate that, Ellen, because you've you've pointed that out and it's it's just true. It's the way it needs to be. And hopefully this is keeps you from being too blindsided because. You know, um, the kids, you know, they sometimes feel like they can say whatever, um, you know, and yes. as they're older and adults, because they still, I'm sure, you know, they always know more than, than the parent and, um, always. and always. don't let it stop you from right from what you are, are trying to accomplish and achieve in your life. And, um, you know, lastly, as we're wrapping up, Ellen, before we go, I ask all of our guests, um, if they can, you know, impart on our listeners what you've learned about divorce and representing women throughout your career that you could share with them. In terms of divorce, you know, it's what I was saying. It gets worse before it gets better. But when it gets better, it gets so, so much better. It's like there's a light that's at that end that, you know, you're not in the tunnel. It's almost like you're coming out of this cave and, and you you can feel the music and you can feel the flowers and you can feel this, this breath of energy. And in terms of representing women, females, you know, we, we are kind of conditioned to take on all of the pain and suffering and weight of the world, whether it's our kids or our husbands or, you know, anyone around us, we're nurturers. That's really who we are we forget to nurture ourselves. And so sometimes you need that good foundation, that good group of people around you to say, hey, I'm going to check you right now because you're taking care of seven people. You're not taking care of yourself and you got to take care of yourself. You know, are you going to your therapies? Are you having a night off? Are you reading the book you want to read? Are you taking the time to reinvest in yourself in the way that you have invested in everybody else, whether you have kids or not, whether you have a husband or not, females take care of everybody else you kind of need somebody to remind you to take care of yourself too well and you have reminded us of that for sure today ellen and we really appreciate it thank you so much for being on the show anyone who wants to find out more about ellen ball uh, you can just go to floridawomenslawgroup.com and we so appreciate having you today ellen and i know our listeners have enjoyed it thank you so much absolutely thanks for having me 
Thank you for joining me for this episode of Women Winning Divorce. If you or someone you know is looking for answers regarding divorce, reach out to us at floridawomenslawgroup.com and also join the conversation on social at Women Winning Divorce. Women Winning Divorce is the place for an elevated conversation on how women can thrive during times of adversity in order to live their best life.